Welcome everyone. Welcome to the Worldwide Workshop, where we'll be discussing childhood. Today we're going to talk about our favorite childhood memories and how those influence our child care practice. Justin, yes. what's your favorite childhood memory? I think my, my number one would be in elementary school when I got a chance to hear Robert Munch read The Paper Bag Princess and David's Father. And David's Father became one of my favorite uh, books because just the way that Robert Munch um, had the inflections in his voice and talked about that and that passion for reading and the way that he read it too was um, he would read it who the author was and who the illustrator was mm -hmm. and then he talked about the book and then he was asking questions so I feel that from that experience I find that I read in a similar fashion because of that first introduction and you know what's funny I actually don't like reading but when it's children's books and the way that Robert Munch read it um, it took that pressure out of reading yeah, a lot of people um, who are new to uh, reading stories to children mm -hmm. struggle with like tripping over their words or being nervous about getting the story right or yeah. like pronouncing something. And uh, yeah, and you just don't need to have that much pressure because it's yeah. not really about reading verbatim word for word. It's about getting the feeling and the story across yeah. to the children and making space for them to react and reflect in that story. Um, about what's going on, like the paper bag princess. You know? And he said to like us, and I'll still remember that, that you just have to like read. And um, if you read it ahead of time, before you read it to mm -hmm. another audience, then it kind of gives you some familiarity if you're nervous about reading. And I think um, all through school, I hated reading, even though I liked that memory. But when I got into early childhood, reading children's books, that memory brought out and I was able to tell my own stories and, and go off of different things. Yeah, it's more of a performance than it yeah. is just reading, right? It's yeah. like um, you find the rhythm of the story, you find where the rhymes are, you find where the voice gets louder and quieter, faster and slower, and you just have a good time with it. It's, you know, it's not about, again, it's not about reading word for word. Right. It's about performing this book for these kids sort of thing. Yeah. And uh, for me, um, for me, when I was uh, reading to my uh, niece and nephew when they were young, I used to use silly voices. Um, and my brother and sister-in-law make fun of me for that. Because, you know, I make like, la la la, princess. Like, I make a real, like, voice change, you know, like, uh, in a paper bag princess. It's like, hey, dragon! Like, really loud and, and stuff like that. Um, and they just thought that was silly and ridiculous because I was making a fool of myself. And I'm like, that's what you're supposed to do. Yeah. You're not supposed to read a word for word and get them to imagine the the character's voice. You've got to make the character come to life. That's right. So, um, you know, I was insecure about that for a little bit after that. But, you know, then I realized, no, no, I know what I'm talking about. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> They're crazy. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I don't even care if I am the crazy one. I would rather sit down and listen to somebody with some crazy voices and, like, you know, make it more entertaining than just kind of like a word for word sort of situation. Well, even that Imagine. book with no word or sorry, no pictures, mm. it's all about voice and, and the way that you are theatrical. So I think it's great that more of those books are coming out. Yeah, absolutely. So what about you? What about your childhood memory? Well, when I was thinking about it, my absolute favorite childhood memory, and this might be because of the time of the year, because it's, you know, moving toward Christmas. But uh, my favorite childhood memory is me and my brother living in Toronto with my mom um, at an apartment on St. Clair Street. And uh, she got us the, the movie The Grinch from the video rental store. You used to do that back in the day. And then she oh, got us... Old. Uh, oh, I'm old, all right. And then she got us four kinds of snacks, all in these special silver bowls and set it all up. And she turned the bedroom into a movie theater like it was a a little old glass screen heavy TV and VCR. And then, um, oh, it might not even have been that. It might have been coming on CBC. Like it might have been before the VCR days, honestly. Anywho. And then she had like the, the little bowls of like candy and popcorn and whatever else. And, you know, we all got cuddled up together in the bed and watched this movie. And it was just such a special moment 
because she took the time to take like an ordinary mundane like we're watching TV and made it. We are having family time. Yes. We're being cozy together. We've got special treats and they're displayed nicely. And it's like just a special moment. She made an ordinary moment special. Mm -hmm. And um, I find that that's something that we as educators can do really, you know, fairly regularly. We can take something as simple as, you know, you're sitting in the grass and just like read a book under a tree and, you know, get really... I, I take it back to reading because, right, you know, yes. that's, that's where I go. But like reading a book under the tree in the summer and like listening to the leaves and, the you know, looking at the sun and all that and bringing out a blanket so that like there's a special space to sit on and, you know, again, having a little snack there with you so that you can just really kind of like get lost in the moment and really enjoy it. I find it's really important to make the ordinary very special for children. I think that's one of the reasons why... Um the sleepovers that we did at Peter Green Hall were successful because that was the vibe that you wanted to kind of do throughout the entire um, sleepover event. Yeah, we would uh, we would completely transform the classroom, take everything that was in there out, and then set up a, like a full wall projection movie screen, and then uh, the, the the beds, the mats that they would sleep on with yeah. their sleeping bag. They pick out their special sleeping bag spot, and. Um, and I was so annoyed because it was like, oh, this mess, and we have to move it around. But then when the actual thing happened, mm. it was so fun just watching the children, like, get cozy in their little sleeping bag or tiptoe around. Yeah, and find a spot next to their best friend and, like, play little clapping games while the movie's going on. Yeah. And just, like, make it really special. Yeah, yeah. I really love that. All right. So, what next? What What was another one of your... Uh... Um, I think the other thing would be my Aunt Sharon. Oh, Sharon. Uh, shout, shout out, out to, to Sharon. Sharon. Um, and I think it was because she had a background in early childhood. Mm -hmm. She had her education degree, but art was her like language. I felt mm -hmm. I remember her, um, creating a, uh, there's a rainbow actually. We just had a rain and the rainbow's there. Beautiful. So she would, she, I remember her creating, um, a wedding dress, but every thing that, uh, she does is so intentional mm -hmm. and there's like a purpose for it. I mean, and there's like times where she would um, just like find something when we go for a walk and like make things. Mm -hmm. And I find that um, when I take children out in nature or just on walks, I make it special where I tell stories or if I find something, I will create something out of like nothing or the materials around. Mm -hmm. So Sharon and I kind of um, brought that art aesthetic, mm -hmm. I guess that's what it's called. Yeah, and almost like making something from nothing, making yeah. something amazing and beautiful from ordinary objects, you know, really kind of, again, making things special that are ordinary. And she always found joy in everything. So mm -hmm. um, that's something that I take with me and I think about her when I'm working with the children. I'm like, what would she do? Because she's so silly mm -hmm. and just like, uh, what's the word? Uh spontaneous mm -hmm. and I find that's kind of like the way that I work and I saying it loud actually I see my similarities in her and the way that she works like she loves telling spooky stories mm -hmm. and like scaring you mm -hmm. and I still do that today because of those kind of things yeah it's when you know when I met your aunt Sharon for the first time I kind of felt like she really had this relationship with you where she got to be a kid with you yeah and I think that was kind of the key to that. You know, when we work with children, it's our excuse to go back to childhood yeah. and silliness and fun and, and like silly pettiness. Like, no, it's your fault or you did it first. Right. La, 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 la. But with a silly voice, you know, not actually to antagonize anybody. Right. Yeah. But like, th that's kind of the yeah. vibe I got from her that she got to be a kid with you. And I, I think that's one of the reasons um, that people stay in the field as long as they do is because they find it's a chance to go back to childhood and enjoy the parts of yeah. childhood that are, you know, so magical and so special. I mean, as an adult, you wake up, make breakfast, go to work, pay bills. Uh, yeah. But like, if you get to work with kids, I mean, you know, we could see a rainbow and talk about a rainbow. Can you do that as an adult? I don't know. I haven't been an adult in a long time. You know, can yeah. you jump in a puddle as an adult? Can you make a mud pie? Can you pick up a stick and turn it into a magic wand? Like the other day, yeah. um, it snowed mm. here in Nova Scotia and, uh, I was working with these children, like visiting practicum students, and the children were like eating snow. And a lot of people would say that's disgusting. And then I was asking them what it tastes like, and someone said, "Oh, it tastes like nachos." 
And then look quickly, I thought, nachos? So you've had nachos before? What do you have on them? And she's like, oh, there's like, she was describing the whole um, experience and then eating it and just enjoying it. And so I was like, well, I better try that. So here I'm eating and everyone's looking at me like, what's going on? I'm like, well, we're having a plate of nachos. Yeah. Like that's happening. And everyone's like, what are you doing? Yeah. It's a lot easier with snow than it is with a mud pie because we ain't yeah. eating the mud pies. Maybe. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, so yeah. So what about you? What's another memory? So for me, okay. So this is going to be um, a weird one for anyone who knows me. Um, I do not have a good relationship with my father. I have zero relationship with my father probably since I was 16 years old. And, uh, you know, I don't have a lot of fond memories. But I thought it was important to include something from that part of my life because I included my mother and, you know, whatever. So, um, the best memory I have of spending time with my father is when I was, I don't know, between 10 and 12 years old. And one day I came home from school after, you know, thinking about outer space, maybe we were learning about different galaxies and, you know, how many planets there were and how many stars. And I was just talking to him about like the possibilities of what could be on other planets, what could be in other galaxies, you know, the potential mm -hmm. of infinity and how anything could be on any other planet, you know, and he got into that conversation and was talking to me about it and like, yeah, and it could, you know, it could be this or it could be that. And, and, um, and it was just really wonderful, especially for that relationship that had been so negative and strained and uh, corrective, I guess, is, uh, you know, everything I had ever said or done was always criticized or punished. Uh, from him. So it was nice to be in a conversation that wasn't me being correct. It was like me being creative with my thoughts and him buying into that and actually listening to me, listening to my ideas and considering the possibility because he didn't know. Right. You know what I mean? And it was, um, and I use that every day in the way that I talk to children. You know, when, when children have questions or wonderings about things, it's like, you know, I may think I know, but I don't necessarily know. And it doesn't really matter that I share, you know, what my thought is on what is the difference between brown, you know, fully brown ducks and ducks that have green heads and brown bodies. Like, does it matter that I know this fact? Not really. It's more about the wondering, about listening to the children's thought, observation, and theory about what is the possibility of that. Yeah. Um, one mistake that he did make even in this best moment was uh, I said something about, yeah, they, there could even be a world that like people look like cartoon characters. And he's like, no, no, that's just stupid. <laughs> you know what I mean? So it wasn't, it wasn't a perfect moment, yeah. but it was the best moment I had had with him. Nice. Um, and, and it's just about being heard and listened to. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Have you experienced any of that with your children or in your childhood? Um, I think we had conversations all the time and that leads into like my grandparents. They would always um, wonder and like ask questions mm -hmm. to us, which made us always think um, deeper than just saying one word answers. Yeah. Like for example, if someone liked the rainbow, mm -hmm. they would say, well, what do you like about that rainbow? Mm -hmm. And it's like, who asks a child that? Right. Yeah. Or how did that rainbow get there? Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, uh, what is your other, your other childhood memory that well, is special? It is my grandparents because we would, for example, the memory that I have is going to the cottage mm -hmm. and, uh, they're, they're also, I guess my family's really silly when I think about it, but it didn't seem like it at the time. But I mean, there's a story where, um, my grandmother is very, uh, showy, I guess. Like everything has to be a certain way. And I think I get that a little bit where it's like what is it, OCD, or it has to be perfect. Mm -hmm. So she, like, sets the table. But she sets the table so that it looks beautiful and inviting. So when I think about when I set up snack or things that are um, for children, I think about those moments, like, how are they going to look at it? Mm -hmm. So I set it up in that way. Recently, I started doing that at, mm -hmm. uh, at my in my classroom because, you know, over COVID, um, we've had to like, you know, not use dishes unless we can wash them in a commercial dishwasher, which we obviously don't have in our class. Right. So we've been using disposable dishes and then, you know, paper towels and 
just on the table and everything is like plopped on sort of thing and not really beautiful or special. But recently because, you know, numbers are getting low and restrictions are loosening and everything's getting a little bit closer to normal. Um, I was just like, oh, tablecloths. I could use a tablecloth. Yeah. We're allowed to use soft things again. Right. So I just put on this tacky, uh, flowery tablecloth on the table. And um, it wasn't an attractive snack. It was like rice cakes with wow butter and bananas. I mean, I don't know how to make that pretty. The setup is, you know. Oh, I, mean? I can. Of course you can. But anyway, I, I couldn't make it beautiful. But I mean, the tablecloth was enough. The kids were like, ooh, yeah. what, why is there a special tablecloth on the table? Are we having a special snack today? I'm like, yes, we are. We're having, <laughs> right. you know, our regular Monday morning snack sort of thing. Um, and it just kind of like made the table a little bit more attractive made the snack time a little bit more special, you know, brought the children together and made it separate from the rest of the room sort of thing. Yeah. Um, and it was really lovely, um, you know, and then I started getting platters, like I had this giant plastic golden plate and, you know, I can fan out the cheeses and mm -hmm. fan out the cucumbers and peppers and, you know, the pita bread and make it look beautiful. Right. And it really kind of invites the children over like, oh, this is a special snack. Yeah. And, uh, Matthew is preparing this with us because, you know, he loves us or this is, you know, a special time for us, that sort of thing. So, And that was something that, like, my grandfather would do, like, have us in the kitchen mm -hmm. with him to see all of these things happening. And the way that they're displaying this food was, like, this big event, mm -hmm. right? So I'm making that. And sometimes we'd have music playing with the children and things like that. Yeah. For me, during my childhood, I didn't really experience a lot of that. Um, the, the special aesthetics of things. Um, and I don't know if it was, you know, it was you know, four kids and often my mother was single <laughs> most of the time. So it was like, you know, was she taking the time to, to do that? No, she was making sure that we were fed right. and that we were, you know, on our way sort of thing. I don't know. Maybe it wasn't a priority for her either, but, um, it could also be a cultural thing. It could be a cultural thing. That's true. Um, Though I don't think so. I think lots of uh, people in, you know, who are uh, of European descent in Canada still do like special centerpieces and right. things like that at Thanksgiving and Christmas and whatever special dinners they have. Um, but for my family, it just wasn't. So whenever I think of those things, I think of Justin and then I do it. You know what I mean? I don't think of my childhood and I'm like, I'd really like to make this seem special. I think of how Justin made things beautiful and special. I think of Bobby at Peter Green Hall and how she used to make things look special. And Annette, when I worked with her and she used to make everything look aesthetically pleasing, you know, yeah. we're doing an art activity where you just plot markers and then put papers. So she's like, no, 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 we have to, you know, have a, a, a what is it? Like a placemat set up and like the things are just so and everything is exactly where it needs to be to really make you want to come over that sort of thing. So yeah, I look at my adult uh, interactions for that sort of inspiration. Yeah. yeah. So what was your um, other childhood memory? So my uh, last childhood memory that I wanted to share was a memory about taking risk. And, um, you know, I, I'm from the age where our parents used to say, go outside and play, you know, regardless of what time it was. If it was dark, then they wouldn't necessarily say it. But yeah. if it was light outside, she was having, you know, coffee with my Aunt Doris and talking. And she's like, get out, get out of the house, go play somewhere. So we would just go into our backyard where there was this old falling apart sh uh, garage shed. And it was maybe 12 feet off the ground to the peak of the roof sort of thing. It looked huge at the time because I was, you know, maybe seven or eight. Yeah. I was there with my, uh, you know, my best friends at the time, Drew and Dale and my older brother, Sean. And uh, we found this tarp and um, we had recently, I don't know, seen some, the old, um, the old videos that you used to see on TV about like hang gliding. You know what I mean? Like the, those Canadian moments. Right. Anyway, so we had seen this and we're like, oh, we could make that too. So we got an, uh, a rebar iron rod, <laughs> bent it into an angle, about 90 degrees, and then poked holes through a tarp and stuck the tarp into it so that it, you know, re it looked like a hang glider. Right. It was way smaller and way heavier. Um, and we were like, oh yeah. So then we climbed up onto the roof. There was a, you know, an old truck parked next to our garage. So we climbed up onto the back and onto the roof of the truck and then back up onto the roof of the garage, brought the thing up there. And we looked down and we're like, and my backyard was a granite slab 
full granite rock everywhere. Not some rocks, but a giant rock. If you were, if you fell on it, you were breaking bones. Right. Um, and we were like, yeah, this looks a little bit risky. Wow. So we decided to take all of the old furniture from inside the garage and make a, a soft landing. So we put like couch cushions yes. on top of the granite. Problem solving. Problem solving. And then we were like, yeah, this is, you know, this is going to be good. And then we were like, oh, but what about like, what if it doesn't work? Shouldn't we have a parachute to, <laughs> to let out? So we got some rope and took some more tarp and made a parachute. And we thought, hey, we should really test the parachute out first before we test out the hang glider because the parachute is our safety net. Right. So what we would do is wait for a gust of wind and we would run and jump off of a 12 foot high garage and jump down onto the, um, the pillows below sort of thing. And, uh, you know, we did that, you know, a bunch of times. We probably took 10 turns between the four of us. Um, before I fell down and hit my knee up into my jaw and cracked my teeth together. Um, That's great. And then I, you know, ran inside to my mom. I'm like, oh, I hurt my, uh, I hurt my teeth. I, I jumped and landed and hit my knee into my teeth. She didn't know I had jumped off the garage, you know, 12 feet high onto granite. And she's like, let me see. And she's like, oh, you're not bleeding. So, you know, do you want to stay inside or do you want to go back outside and play? And I'm like, I want to go back outside. Um, so, you know, that's, that's a really funny, risky memory. And it, um, it's, it's really important to me because I think that kids need to take risks. You know, we, we came up with the idea of putting a soft ground and making a parachute before right. trying this death trap of a hang glider, which we never, ever used, actually. Thank God. Like, it literally would have pulled us down faster. Yeah. Um, and, you know, but by, you know, being on our own and taking risks, we knew that we had to come up with the safety net. We knew that my mother was having coffee inside. She wasn't watching us. This wasn't, you know, child approved safety sort of thing. So I think it's important for kids to play things that are, are, are risky, to climb trees a little bit higher. So they get that feeling in their stomach, like this isn't, this isn't necessarily safe. Yeah. So how am I going to make it safe for me? Do you know what I mean? Um, I had kids in my uh, after schooler class. We used to have these, uh, we used to go to the Oaks um, behind St. Mary's University where uh, the wind had knocked one tree down flat and another tree down into another tree that like was Y section sort of thing. So there was like this angle and this tree below. So um, they used to, you know, take turns walking up the tree going higher and higher. At the highest point of the tree, it was you know, eight and a half to 10 feet high. I can't really remember, but I knew it was well, high enough. Couldn't that get it. I couldn't, I couldn't reach their feet from the ground as an adult male. So I was like, that's high. You know what I mean? So, you know, but they would go up the tree and, oh, you know, I'm nervous. I'm going to turn back and go down and go up the tree. And then the kids would be behind them and they had to negotiate how to get down and stuff. And we were there making sure it was safe, but we were letting them engage in risk and risk assessment in a way that they got, you know, excited and scared and made the adjustment to come back down mm -hmm. rather than us saying, that's too dangerous, come down. Yeah. Now, there is a point where it would be too dangerous. Um, and that would be if I, I saw that they weren't assessing their risk, I would be like, oh, you know, I see that, you know, that's making me nervous. I'd like, I, yeah, I would set the limit if I saw that they weren't assessing risk themselves. But, you know, allowing children to play in, play with risk, play in risky ways, um, as long as you're, you know, aware of what the potential hazards are and aware of what's going to, what could happen, but not necessarily put that out into the world. <laughs> you know, we're not going to say, stop, you're going to fall, because right. we're saying you're going to fall, so they're probably going to fall. Instead, we say, ooh, how does that feel? That's right. You know, when I'm high like that, I feel it in my stomach, because I'm not sure if I'm... I'm and you know, you enough. could even say... Um... That's me. Like you can talk about yourself. You're this high, and this is how it's making me feel. Yeah. And then the children can recognize like your feelings too at the moment. Yeah, and, and put words to the things that they're yeah. feeling. You know. Um, yeah. So I think uh, that's one of the reasons that I am such a risk you know, taker. A risk taker as a teacher. I allow children to to play risky games. I allow them to play rough games um, because when I was a kid, that was that was what I did. That was what I wanted to do. Yeah. And it was, you know. And it all worked out for me, so you know we're we're gonna try to make sure it works out for them as well. That's right. 
Anyway, so this is uh, this is our childhood. Maybe you guys in the comments section would like to share moments of your childhood that influence your practice or that, you know, uh, help you decide to be a teacher or maybe just fun stories. I don't know. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, uh, please subscribe. The more subscribers we get, uh, the better our videos get. Share it. Share it. Share with your friends and uh, we'll see you next and, time. And uh, comment in the comments because that helps us um, improve the videos more, um, maybe topics that you want us to cover. So please comment below. Feedback is wanted. Feedback is wanted, yes. Anyway, so thank you very much. Thanks and bye, see you next bye. time. So before I rudely interrupted Justin, he had one more story to share about childhood. Go ahead, Justin. <laughs> I wanted to talk about uh, my mom because she took care of children for a good portion of my childhood. And uh, she would bring in children from the community, which was mostly now my friends. And so the reason why I want to bring that up is because um, where community was so important to her, um, it is now to me where I try to reach out to different people in my career now to connect them all. So I use my mom as that inspiration saying, because she would like um, talk to the neighbors and then they would say something about like food and then we would they would make like almost like a potluck and then she would serve us the food while she's taking care of us. So it wasn't only just her like trying to make us all these suppers and lunches and all of these things. Mm -hmm. They actually made it, gave it to her and then she was able to like do that but take care of all of us. Yeah. And that, it's interesting because with my dis learning disability, um, after I was about 10, she started to like put her presence into the school system mm -hmm. and like go there. And that's why she did early childhood education and started like um, taking that two year program, which I also graduated from where she went to school too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, my mom was uh, big on that too. She was big on like developing the community of friends. You yeah. know what I mean? Like we didn't have a lot of money. And uh, she, but she found ways to welcome our friends in and make them feel welcome at our house and allow us to go feel welcome at their house. Um, yeah. And I remember she, for Halloween, she would make caramel apples and uh, you couldn't give out caramel apples for Halloween because, you know, razor blades and drugs or whatever. Um, but what she would do is she'd make special caramel apples for my friends and then for regular trick-or-treaters, we'd give a regular candy sort of thing. And it was just kind of like this really special thing because it was like, oh, you're, you know, yeah. you're a member of this community yeah. um, and, and you're giving more of your time, more of your energy to this community, right. that sort of thing. Well, and also it, it kind of, well, years later when you and I got to Peter Green Hall and we started thinking about the hundred languages mm. and the way that when we went to Hong Kong in 2017 with Raffaella, she was talking about the 100 languages a day where people from the community would come in and share their experiences. And I think that's something that um, like our parents are probably indicating. Yeah, that um, that 100, 100 languages day was really special yeah. uh, in Hong Kong. They would bring in um, like, like a mechanic a, yeah. because you know there's a mechanic across the road and the children sometimes see the mechanic on their way in and they discuss it. So they invite him or her to come in and share kind of like just a little demonstration of what a mechanic does sort of thing um, and the time that we were there she had this really interesting um, music and dance group that used like not necessarily buckets. yeah not instruments but like buckets and you know sticks and stuff like that to make their music yeah. um, and they were the coolest they were so fun it was like all of my you know childhood tv memories all wrapped into one like Fred Penner's Place and Mr. Dress Up yeah. and Sharon Lois and Bram all that sort of feeling from these three women yeah. who were like, you know, just moving and getting us to like hear this music and hear the rhythm and just like move their body. And they would get the kids to stand up rather yeah. than just sitting down and just watching. And again, it was about making a fool of themselves. You know what I mean? Like they were in it in for it. Like, yeah, in it for the fun. Yeah. They were all over the place. And it was not like I'm performing for you. I'm this yeah. or that. It was like they were getting into the crowd. Yes. You know, getting getting the kids to hit the drums, sort right. of thing, and moving, and anyway, it was a blast. Um, really special thing that we got to see because we happened to be here there on that day, the one time we went we? to Hong Kong. Shout and, out to Raphael. And I'm gonna put a link below this, um, actually, 
to her hundred languages video that she made. Oh, nice. So I'll put the link down below for that. And we might be interviewing her for one of our interview videos. What what? Yes. So is that all you had to say? That is all. Okay. So now, uh, but wait. wait. But wait, there's more. Now we want to say thank you very much and goodbye. Again, leave your comments and uh, can't wait to see you next time. See you. Bye.